It's been 15 years since the Latham Report, constructing the team, criticised design teams for unnecessarily duplicating information and argued that the use of coordinated project information should be a contractual requirement. And so it came to pass. The recent JCT Constructing Excellence contract has collaboration as its overriding principle. Technology has been reasonably quick to respond to the challenge of how to encourage efficiencies and enhance integration across the project team. Building Information Modelling, BIM, is the latest and one of the most exciting solutions on offer. BIM uses computer-generated models containing intelligent data relating to its construction, procurement and maintenance. Changes anywhere automatically update through the project information package. Integration by default, some might say, but undoubtedly impressive. So the question is, in these harsh economic times, can we afford to buy into these exciting new collaborative technologies? Or can we afford not to? We are delighted to have two leading voices in collaborative working and BIM technology to explain to us what it's all about. Steve Reyes is the principal lecturer at the School of Architecture at Oxford Brookes University and the first lecturer in the UK to incorporate a lecture on BIM in relation to the JCT Constructing Excellence contract into the practice and management model uh, for diploma students. Nicholas Nisbet is a director at AEC3 where he leads work on software development including XML development within Building Smart and was a key contributor to BS1192 collaborative production of architectural engineering and construction information published in 2007. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, before we get on to the technology, can we start um, by talking a little bit about these drivers for collaborative working that we've just mentioned? And I'll come to you first, Steve, if I may. The JCTCE uh, Constructing Excellence contract, can you just explain what it is and, and what it aims to do? I think it's a brave new document which tries to give project teams a more comfortable commercial environment uh, for working together collaboratively and in an integrated way. Any project team needs uh, protocols, procedures, uh, checks, balances, and that's what the JCTCE contract tries to do. Um, it's not perfect. It has some way to go. Uh, it builds on NEC uh, forms of uh, more, more positive forms of contract uh, and on PCC 2000 uh, positive forms of contract. Uh, so I think it's a step on the way uh, and I think it should be nurtured as much as we possibly can. Okay, because constructing excellence used to be called building excellence a few years ago, but before the contract was launched in 2007 I read Building Magazine bet that it would remain a niche contract. Is that, is that how it's actually panned out? Well I think, uh, I think like all, all media these days, uh, Building Magazine sort of wanted uh, headlines and, and quick fixes. There aren't going to be any quick fixes here. We're talking about profound cultural change. Uh, we're talking about decades of embedded uh, adversarial working. That will be an evolution over many years, not next week's uh, headline in Building Magazine. And Nick, could you just tell us what the role is of BS 1192, the Code of Practice, and, and what role it plays in this broader debate about collaborative working? Well, what 1192 set out to do was to define what you can reasonably expect uh, your other, uh, the other players in the design team uh, to be using to structure their information and what you should yourself be doing so that when the design team comes together for the first time there are no surprises. Right, because uh, it does relate to this kind of way that pr uh, production information is assimilated within the team, doesn't it? That's the, one of the core uh, uh, drivers for the, for the BS. Absolutely. It covers both uh, the kind of data you should be producing um, and also the processes you should be using to check it before it leaves your office uh, and indeed check it when you receive it from other offices. Right. Because there's this uh, discussion about contracts and legislation being used, whether it's the CE, JCTC contract or, or British standards, of legislation being used to engender collaboration because, as you said, there's a broader social issue to be dealt with. So do you think that you know, using rules and, and, uh, and contracts to enforce integration is uh, helpful, contradiction terms? Or? Well, I think I mean, the contracts, all contracts expect 
and demand information is transmitted. Um, what's starting to happen now is that people are demanding that it should be transmitted in a form that it can be used, um, rather than simple notions of compliance, um, where documents are submitted but not necessarily in a form where they can be checked. The interesting thing about JCTCE is that it provides for a project protocol to be annexed to the contract and there's no reason why that shouldn't be uh, a, a, an interpretation of BS 1192. Fine. On that background note on collaboration, can we just now talk, talk about BIM and really how this kind of idea of collaborative working fits into the wider discussion about BIM. So could you, Steve, just explain in as simple terms as possible what BIM is? I have four notions of a BIM, of BIM. And I think the first one is the current popular notion that it is one software platform. And we all know the usual people in the marketplace who are selling a form of BIM. Uh, so one software platform is the first one. Second one is, uh, is an idea of using a collaborative portal where uh, people need not necessarily use all the same sort of software, but they feel that in contributing their information to a central place, um, they are in some way working together. The third one is, is some idea of a coordinated information set. Um, if you can imagine a major plan plane or a major section plane through a building, and imagine that plane broken down into little tablets of graphics, then the whole project team is contributing to each, each tablet, and that tablet of graphics, each tablet of graphics is whirring away, um, and hopefully it's open, it's editable, coordinated, there are processes um, uh, governing how things, how graphics do change. And finally, the kind of thing that Nick works uh, on a lot is, is perhaps a, new, a neutral database where every type of information, um, whether it be graphic, non-graphic, um, is translated into some kind of neutral database. And people contribute to that database and take a slice out whenever they want information that's relevant to them. Right, so that's... I think there are also three measures around BIMs, and one is... One is, how, how, how much of the project team do you want to inc include? Do you want to include the, the immediate design team, uh, a wider design team, complete and utter everybody in terms of procurement chains? Do you want your BIM to be active during just a design phase, a design construction phase? Or if you're managing a big uh, property portfolio, like a hospital site or MOD, do you want your BIM to last from cradle to grave and cradle to sort of recycle? Uh, and finally, what type of information do you want your BIM to contain? Graphic, non-graphic, contractual, risk registers? What, 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 should, it, what should it have in it? Blimey. Uh, so it covers a multitude of sins, is Absolutely. what you're telling me. Absolutely. But I mean, but that's like different types of BIM. Is there a snappy for uh, BIM novices like me is there a snappy description about what BIM is and does, especially in, in linking in with this collaborative working? I think BIM is all about a pool of information, coordinated information. The key words are that it should be shared and it should be structured. Um, shared so as to get the maximum value out of it, and structured so that as many different processes can use that information in as many different ways as possible. So what's so good about BIM? On, on, to a certain extent, what's... what's developmentally different about BIM to what's gone before? I think um, it's actually about uh, exploiting the competencies of the architects and all the design professionals um, to actually get their experience and knowledge captured and applied effectively rather than going through documents that uh, dilute that uh, knowledge and expertise. I think if you dip underneath the pop popularization of BIM at the moment. It's, it's all about making people in project teams think um, and we've facilitated many, many project teams in our, our lifetimes, Nick and I, uh, to try and work in this way. And I think it's another tool in our armory simply to make people think about the way they work. And even in the most cynical teams, you can find somebody who wants to change slightly and if that's due to a BIM, 
then then fine. And the culture's moved a little bit. But if you're saying, and starting off with this whole discussion, I know Sir Michael Latham started working for the BIW, didn't he, the software package uh, company, um, that if you're saying that there's a need to encourage more collaborative working, does a software tool uh, automatically help with that? Or is it just a mechanism that you have to deal with the problem of lack of collaboration in the first place for the software package to work? I think it's a tool. It's one ingredient. We need a lot. Of, of, of tools to um, make, make this shift in perception and outlook from project teams. So let's move on to this discussion on parametrics, which I will ask you to define uh, and clarify uh, for me and the viewers. But parametrics is central to BIM technology, and I just would like you to explain what it means, especially in relationship to, say, the old CAD or the geometric way of thinking of things. Well, I'll, I'll yeah, take we'll th three, three, <laughs> um, try and take three examples of parametrics. A simple case is, we all know the area of a rectangle is length times breadth. So if you think about anything in a building that's rectangular, wall tile, a ceiling tile, roof tile, a floor tile, a uh, tile in a bathroom, then they're all rectangles. And you can, if you like, um, generate one item in a computer that will deal with rectangles, and perhaps a thickness, and perhaps a material. And somehow, um, either a user gives a, a dimension or a thickness in some, in some way, or it happens due to locating the thing on a, on a CAD platform. So the, the generic equation of length times breadth gets its values filled in. Um, the second thing I, I would see is, is sort of um, complex geometries. Uh, and over the years, there have been all kinds of things sort of generating weird and wonderful shapes uh, to fractal equations. Um, Greg Flynn in 1995 coined this wonderful phrase from his practice in California, blobby texture. Uh, and I guess sort of his examples of the Kunsthaus in Graz in, in Austria and, and uh, Gehry's uh, Guggenheim uh, Museum in Bil Bilbao are examples of, of very complex um, surfaces and shapes, which perhaps, uh, as the theory goes, only a computer could generate. And then I think you add in relationships, um, and that gets very, very complicated in terms of uh, being able to um, do checks, um, read logics, look at implications in things. And so the parametrics get far more complicated in that in that context. Right. Okay, I'm going to move on to you, Nick, then, to do the def definition stuff <laughs> of parametrics, since uh, Steve's <laughs> passed the baton on to you. Because um, I'm just interested to look more deeply at what BIM can do. Because, um, uh, so, obviously, I remember, I'm, I go back to when I used to do computer <laughs> Uh, graphics uh, when XREFs was the big idea. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between, say, this kind of BIM technology and what CAD XREFs can do? I think the, the big difference is that you're designing with objects. Um, they may be virtual inside uh, the BIM tool you're using, but those objects have a close relationship to real objects that are going to get built uh, in the real world. Um, and so uh, the more relationships that object has in your virtual world, the more efficient, efficiently, the more efficient you can be in designing with it. Um, the classic example is if you have uh, um, a door in a wall, uh, a CAD system will let you draw some lines, and if you move the door, you have to move the lines on the wall as well. And uh, what should be a very simple task can become uh, quite an extended one. Um, what BIM allows you to do is to actually uh, think I need to move that door, move it, and all the consequences of that move uh, follow from what you've done. The more rules that are in there, the more power you have at your disposal. Uh, you, don't, you can disable rules, you can ignore them, you can override them, but it does support uh, what architects and engineers want to spend their time doing, which is making decisions about the size and shape and position and properties. Um, of the things that are going to go into a real building. So, parametrics comes from the word parameters, doesn't it? So what you're saying is the parameters are set between, say, that door and the light switch. 
Yes, there are parameters such as the expected distance and which side of the door it should be left or right relative to the hinge. Um, there are, may even be parameters about the height of the light switch uh, above the floor, um, which might be constrained by um, the context of the building regulations in the, in the jurisdiction that you're working in. So the, par the parameters may come from many different places, um, or the restraints on the parameters may come from many different places. Um, but what it helps is it helps the architect to do that job uh, more rapidly um, and with more confidence. Because obviously there's complicated relationships between these parameters. You have to set, or the, the parameters are set within the software, or you as a designer will set them. But then if you move that door and you don't want the light switch to move, you presumably have to switch off that parametric relationship between both those objects. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's exactly um, the, um, any, any relationship like that um, is a, something that can be managed and disabled if it's not helping you do what you need to do. Right. But we're also just talking in these terms about a drawing on a screen. Um, but obviously BIM has implications down the supply chain to other members of the design team. Again, can you just explain how that works um, more, more, more globally within the design team? Well, to start with, the information you captured about the design can be looked at a lot, in lots of different ways. Um, we, we expect now that using BIM, if you draw a plan, you can immediately look at the perspective. You can examine a section, you can examine an elevation. Uh, perhaps most significantly, you can look at a schedule of the information associated to the objects. Architects spend a lot of time uh, developing door schedules and trying to keep them related to the uh, drawings they produce. Uh, instead, you look at these and decide which is the most appropriate uh, representation for making the decisions you're interested in and to checking the decisions you're interested in. And that builds up a level of confidence that that information uh, can be passed on um, to uh, a contractor to help guide his purchasing decisions or whatever um, so that uh, the information is of a high enough quality that it can be done and uh, Steve mentioned the Bilbao Museum where the uh, cladding panels were fabricated from the design model uh, and the um, fabricator of those panels was confident that the panels he made were going to fit uh, because everyone was required to follow the geometry that was in the building information model. So that's not having fabricators redraw the architect's drawing? There were no, absolutely no drawings produced. Um, the, uh, it was a direct digital link um, and because of that the cladding packages were substantially cheaper than expected. A direct digital link to what? The actual manufacturing? The, the actual manufacturing process. Okay, so in terms of this kind of discussion, which we've skirted around slightly about metadata and what that means, there's a, there's a classic definition on Wikipedia, which says maybe a lot for Wikipedia, which is that metadata is information about information. And since all information carries information, everything is metadata. But it, just, just to kind of narrow that down a little bit, um, this metadata stuff we're talking about, the parameters between a door and a socket, or a door and a light switch, you're also talking about parametric relationships between the door information and maybe the cost plan and yeah. the fabricator's information. Yeah. So, I mean, yes. can you, can you yes, I mean, I, 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 I mean, my particular interest at the moment is, is, is relationships between that CAD model and contract and insurance and risk registers and so on. I think since time immemorial, the, the, the non-graphic side, and especially when I would broadly term commercial arrangements within a project team, have been neglected. Um, and I think there's no reason why these ideas of parametrics, um, and particularly the relationship aspect of uh, parametrics, uh, no reason why that can't be extended to co contract procurement, uh, procurement documents, um, specifications, um, maintenance schedules and so on. So yeah, so you're saying that were you to change something in the model then that would automatically update? You might well get a commentary, perhaps a, a, co a contractual commentary, perhaps an insurance commentary, perhaps a, a commentary on your risk register. But that's not, we're not there yet. Oh no, being no, 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 no. Okay. These things have been prototyped. Um, there was some very interesting work was done uh, a few years ago in health and safety that actually 
warned the designer that he was introducing risks in the design um, as he was designing the roof of the building, which was l introducing factors that were likely to cause, or, or um, sorry, likely to cause uh, falls from the roof um, at some later stage. So even very early stage design can actually have a, a relationship to the risk register for the building user. Right, well, we looked at a lot of the different ways that these things pan out. Is it, Presumably, BIM, which is now seen maybe by some people as the holy grail for the future of, uh, of the construction industry, maybe it's not appropriate for all schemes. Am I right in thinking that above a certain level it becomes more appropriate for practices to buy into? I don't think there's any distinction um, between small practices and large practices. Or the um, small value of works or complexity of work? I, I agree with Nick. I, I don't think there's any issue about scale, personally. I think, I think in one sense, in a very general sense, this is all about good practice anyway. It's about coordinating your, your information and, and working with whoever you are working with, even if it's just a small domestic extension. Uh, it doesn't matter. The principles are transferable and scalable. Because there's a recent survey saying the take-up for BIM at the moment is pretty low in this country, isn't it? I mean, uh, do you think that, as we mentioned at the start of the program, do you think that the recession or the economic considerations will be a kick-start kick for people taking this up, actually, or a uh, drag on people taking it up? You can speculate. I, 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 I speculate very often, Austin, on what on earth will make uh, the architectural profession and the construction industry work better together. Uh, I would hope that a recession was some kind of stimulus, uh, and it probably will be to a small extent. Um, but I, in all the years that I've been trying to get people to work in a collaborative way, I've never seen a major uh, influence uh, that, that makes the thing, makes the industry gel all of a sudden. Any thoughts, Nick? Well, I, my experience is that, you know, whatever the scale of the job or the practice, people can get benefit from it. I think there's a new generation of architects who've come through and are familiar with these tools and want to make them work, uh, want to make them have the, a more agile practice. Um, and so I think uh, uh, at that end of the market, the, uh, um, the, the, they are forcing the way. Um, and I think the, the, the larger, more established practices will have to react um, because uh, the expectations that clients have um, are only going up, and it's a question of which of those practices can actually deliver. Just add a, a quick point to that from, from an academic uh, viewpoint. I have direct contact with something like 300 students every year, uh, and certainly make it in my way for them to write something on, on IT and, and BIMS and so on. Um, and it, I think it is quite interesting how they are already getting to grips with the idea of cloud, cloud computing and some of these new ideas of collaboration. And some of them are even thinking about forming their own companies and hiring the old guys like me to, to, to fill in the bits of expertise that they don't have. But they, they can see immediately, uh, rather than the sort of cynical generation that we, <laughs> we belong to, they can see immediately the benefits in trying to work like this. On the other hand, can I, on, yeah. on the other hand, it always amazes me that, that in, and I'm going to partly contradict what I'm saying here, is that I deal with part three, which is the final um, uh, examination to go on the architect's legal register. And it is amazing how many younger generation come back with cynical attitudes uh, when they've been out in practice. You know, and there is this dichotomy between, on the one hand, during their education, they can see these ideas, but as soon as they get out there, um, they're met with a wall of cynicism. Okay. Well, speaking as a whippersnapper uh, in this, uh, in this um, environment. Uh, I'm certainly not cynical about it, and I think that's a very, very interesting uh, exposition, a starting point about understanding something which is uh, pretty futuristic. Uh, but hopefully, much of this stuff is just around the corner, and our brief foray into building information modelling has come to an end, I'm afraid, for now. We'll be revisiting this topic, as you can tell, uh, in the very near future, as there's very much to explore uh, in the range of BIM products and project applications. Please take a look at the study notes for more information. But until the next time, I'd just like to thank Steve Race from Oxford Brooks and Nick Nisbet from AEC3 for making a fantastically complicated subject easily digestible. From all of us here, 
Goodbye for now.